Good morning to the rest of the church online. <laughs> Everybody's home because of the storm, and they say the really bad weather's coming after 1 o'clock. So uh, I'm praying the Holy Spirit moves, and we just have to camp out here for the next week or two. But uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. But we're glad you're here, and uh, we're going to just, uh, if you can, encourage you to come down front just a little bit more. And uh, glad that you're here. We're going to get started anyway. And uh, the Lord is here. I was just telling... Uh, couple ladies that in 23 years of pastoring in Toronto, we canceled Sunday morning once because of a uh, snowstorm, and that was four and a half feet. 
and I kind of equivocate bad weather in Pensacola with rainstorms as opposed to snowstorms. And I don't think we've ever canceled a Sunday morning because of bad weather yet. So um, we are just here and hunkering down and ready to go. And we're going to have church. Is that all right? So I don't know about you, but I, uh, I love that Hezekiah Walker, uh, Every Praise Belongs to You. That's a great video and a great song. Well, he just released another one called Better. And it says that things are going to get better. And when you look at what's going on in the world, we're praying and believing God it's going to get better. So would you stand with me and we're just going to worship the Lord and uh, we're going to have a chance. JT, come and join me up here in the front if you would. And we're going to just worship together and we're going to show you this video. We're going to worship. It's just a great song. And then Pastor Ben's going to lead us in worship. So Lord, we come to you right now. We thank you that it is going to be better. And we thank you, Lord, that you are in control of everything. Nothing of this is a surprise to you. And we ask your blessing upon every aspect of the ministry here today in Jesus' name. Let's run the video of uh, Hezekiah. Walker. Come on, somebody bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, we bless you, Jesus. Oh, somebody shout to the Lord with a voice of triumph. Hallelujah. Put your hands together this morning. Come out of the shadows, step out of the grave, break into the wild. And don't be afraid. Run into wide open spaces. Grace is waiting for you. Dance like the weight has been lifted. Grace is waiting. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord there is freedom, there is freedom Come out of the dark, just as you are Into the fullness of His love For the Spirit is here, let there be Is, grace is waiting for you. Dance like the weight has been lifted. Grace is waiting. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is freedom. Do you believe that? Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is freedom. Come out of the door. Put your hands together. Oh, there's freedom in this house today. Hallelujah. Whoa, I believe this. Chains will fall, prison shake at the sound. Jesus' name. Lives made whole, hearts awake at the sound. Jesus' name. Come on, sing that out. Chains will fall. Prison shake in the sound the Jesus name Lives made whole Hearts awake in the sound the Jesus name Come on hey. Where the Spirit of the Lord is There is freedom Come on There is freedom in this house this morning Do you believe that Brownsville? Come on Somebody bless the 
bless the Lord where the Spirit of the Lord is.
feels like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. Oh, this is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. All creation cry. God, say we'll see. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. The all creation cry, God, we praise you. this room. I 
love you this morning.
Everybody bless the Lord. The mountains shake before you. The demons ride and flee. Just at the mention of your name, King of Majesty, there is no power in hell or any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great I am. The mountains shake before you. The demons, they run and flee. Just at the mention of your name, there is no power in hell or any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great I am. Great I am. Great I am. The great I am. The great I am. Coronavirus, 
are issues of concern, of racism right now, You're dealing with the division that's happening in this nation. When the glory of God comes, there's not just only healing, there's power. And the prayer that I pray all the time is, Lord, rule in my life and overrule. In other words, just take control. And I think that's what we need to believe God for right now. That doesn't abdicate us of our responsibility, but it gets us in the right track. And I want us to sing that there's power in your glory. Let's sing that. There is power in your glory. Power. Power in your throughout this next week in our city in our state and in our nation and we're believing God for transformation and change and I'm trusting in him for that well don't hug someone but turn to somebody and tell them that you love them that the power of God is here in this place and we're believing God for what he's going to do right now Well, God bless you. Good to have you here. And uh, you may be seated and just, uh, I know a lot of people were scared off because of the storm, but you're here, I'm here, and I'm glad you're here. And I'm glad those that are online watching as well and uh, excited to have you being part of that. Uh, we changed from the masking tape to the X's on the pews, so it looks a little less obtrusive. Um, I think this is our fourth Sunday back, so we don't have to be quite as restrictive and you can find your way. And I feel a lot more comfortable with that and appreciate everyone's cooperation. And um, Heather, good news. We're going to let you dance on the sides and others as well that need to or want to. Because uh, for the past few weeks, we said, you know, we're just going to kind of hold off on that. But uh, we have these areas over here for those that have banners or flags or worship dance. And that's how you express your worship. Uh, you're welcome to do that and I encourage you. If you're visiting with us, uh, please get a connect card from the pew rack in front of you. Fill that out. Put it in the offering. If you're visiting online, uh, just let us know where you're visiting from and watching from and being part of service this morning. Offering is at the offering boxes on your way out. Uh, we appreciate your faithfulness and your stewardship and giving. Uh, encourage you to do that. We actually received a check this week from someone that has become part of our church family online from out of state, and they sent us a check for $1,000, and that was just awesome, and appreciate that. So God's doing things. We have a pastor in Italy that watches us every Sunday morning, and uh, some in Greece and Sweden and other states. Uh, of course, Canada, we've got a number watching from there as well. Uh, we're going to go to prayer here in just a moment, and we uh, certainly want to be in prayer for um, 
Carlos, our youth pastor, he got tested positive. Um, I said the good news is he hasn't been here for two weeks. Uh, the bad news is he's with his family in Oklahoma and may have infected all of them. So pray for Carlos's family in Tulsa. But uh, being praying for him. And then Taylor, Taylor McGothy, he's uh, had surgery and pituitary gland, very serious surgery, but he's home and doing well. And Ellen's taking care of him. And so remember Taylor in prayer. And then um, Vicki Rozier passed away this week. And uh, Jackie and some of his family are here and say welcome to you and glad that you're here, Jackie. Come on in, Jackie. Come on in. And uh, praying for you. And uh, just the service is going to be uh, this Saturday at 11 o'clock. Visitation is at 10 and encourage you to come. Jackie and Vicki have been part of this church. They were married in the chapel across the street, uh, commissioned as missionaries. And she's had a rough go the past couple years. And uh, she went into hospital Tuesday night, I believe it was, or Monday. And uh, Jackie was expected to take her home. And I stopped by to see him outside of the hospital on uh, Wednesday. And he said, the doctors just told me she's not going to make it through the weekend. And she didn't. And that was horrible. And uh, just uh, too young, uh, 58 years young, and praying for the family. And Jackie, praying for you and others as well. And we're going to go together to the Lord in prayer and uh, lift you up in prayer. I think that's uh, Albert, are you back there and uh, um, praying for, let's just surround Jackie if you would, he's right back there if you would. Terry, would you go near them and Randy? And uh, let's pray for Jackie and the family and lift them up in prayer. And the other sons you guys had over there as well. And we'll pray for Carlos and for Taylor. So just join me in prayer if you would. So Father, we pray in the name of Jesus for each and every one of these requests. You know the heart ache and the heart break. And we pray in the name of Jesus for your divine intervention. Pray that you comfort Jackie and the family, the loss of Vicki, a wife, a mom, a grandma. And we pray you just lift them up as a family and as we come and honor this family this Saturday and all that God you've done through them. And we pray that you just comfort them with your presence and peace. Continue to heal Taylor and his surgery, recovery from the surgery, and Carlos, that this virus will be gone. And I know he's watching online, and we pray for Carlos in the name of Jesus, and that you touch him and deliver him. And we pray protection around his family in Oklahoma and anyone else he was in contact with, that there'll be no contagious virus transmission there at all. And we thank you, Father, for your healing touch, whether it's spirit, soul, or body, whether it is physical or emotional, we thank you for your healing. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. And Jackie, we're praying for you and your family and continue to support you and uh, just believe in God for you. So, tough stuff, hard. And I uh, want to just remember them in prayer. Let's see, I think Ed, you and Deborah are here. Ed, Deborah, Fantana, you guys are here. Can you come down just for a quick second? Would you come and join me here? You got to come around this way if you would. That'd be great. Um, Someone called me and said, you had a special day that just happened. Um, I think, was Ed, was it yesterday? Was that the day? Yesterday? 50-year anniversary of their wedding. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, so good. Come on up, come on up, come on up, come on up. Here, Ed, give me your, you guys okay there? One step at a time. There you go, Ed, I got you. Come on up. I need a handheld here. I'll grab, you got one? Thanks. Wow. 50 years that is awesome and your family sent something for you as well we got some flowers for you they sent it yesterday and that's for you guys so make sure after service you get to take it home and have that we're going to put it right down here in front and just turn around so everybody can see it in the congregation and we'll have it there but they want to surprise you and i think you got some family here with you this morning is that right yeah all right and help me who's here with you who's here you got to use that family why don't you stand up we want to welcome you this morning as well we're glad you're here that is so good so who's here with you? Uh, daughters Melody and Jenny and Candy. That is awesome. And uh, 50 years, where did you get married? We're in Michigan. Uh, Got to hold the mic over here, Ed, for her to hear. There we go. Waterford Township. Waterford Township. What's that near? Because I was in Michigan for a while. Uh, near Pontiac. Pontiac. Okay, well, I was in Ferndale and okay. Hazel Park area, so I know exactly where you are. Uh -huh. So that is awesome, and that's exciting. And yeah. So you had a bit of a celebration yesterday, and that oh, was yeah, good? Oh, yeah, we went to our daughter's house and had celebration. <laughs> And you got some flowers here already too. That's nice. So 
Well, we're just going to pray God bless you for another 50 years. How's that sound? Wow, that <laughs> that else would be a miracle, but that's all right. <laughs> so, Father, we thank you for Ed and Deborah right now and for 50 years. That doesn't happen by accident. It happens by two things. Their commitment to you and each other and your commitment to them and helping them. And I thank you, Lord, for them. I thank you for their, their marriage. I thank you for their family. And we bless them and thank you for them and honor them this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, bless you. Yeah, can you give me a hand, Gene, here and help him down? That'd be great. Wait for Gene here, if you would. And congratulations. I've got somebody else that's uh, a guest here this morning, called me this week. Fred, come on up, if you would. And uh, Fred Higgins is an Assembly of God uh, U.S. missionary. Uh, I love this. You are, I'll wait till you get up here. You are a missionary to who? Motorcyclists. Motorcyclists. Bikers. Bikers. Amen, Bikers. Brother. So how long you been a biker? Well, I started riding motorcycles in 1966, and so I guess a week or two, brother. A week or two. <laughs> that is good. Now, were you ever part of a gang or just a... Well, when I was younger, I did ride with some motorcycle clubs for a while. Uh, when I was younger than I should have been, I was in bars when I wasn't old enough to be there. As a matter of fact, when I was 16 years old in Daytona Beach, riding a three-wheel motorcycle, now that would have been 1969, three-wheel motorcycle, a bar hired me as their doorman and their bouncer because I was the meanest looking guy they could find. So if you think I'm not too pretty now, you should have seen me then. <laughs> so one, one question, missionary to motorcyclists, what does that look like? I'm not quite sure how, what that looks like. Well, you know, different people do motorcycle ministry different ways, Pastor. Right. What I've always done is relationship-based ministry. And so it's not about having 20 guys follow me around. It's about getting in the middle of the hardcore bikers and speaking the truth to them in love, befriending them, being there to pray right. for them. That's good. Amen. Yeah, So, and, and that works. It does, Pastor. Can I tell you about three guys? Tell me about one guy. I want to hear about the all together, all three guys together. Well, sort of, but all it's, right. it's all tell relevant. Me. Well, about a week ago, well, let's see, I got here two weeks ago. So about three weeks ago, I baptized a retired drill sergeant in the river in the middle of nowhere in Georgia. Now, he lives in Michigan now, and he's about to move to California because his wife is marrying a Hell's Angel. He was in a motorcycle club when I met him about 15 wow. years ago, I'd say. And he got serious about God recently, called me up. He was all excited and asked me if I'd baptize him. And we figured out what worked for both of us. Now, let me tell you how excited he was, Pastor. He was so excited that he was out standing in the middle of the river before we could even think about what was going on. He was ready to be baptized. <laughs> and so that's what God does. He touches and changes lives. Yeah. But there's two other guys I'd love to tell you sure. about real quick. So there's another man that called me up about six months ago and he said i just wanted you to know that you make a difference well to understand what this guy meant you have to know who he was when i met him he was riding in a hardcore motorcycle club and now he's retired from that club but before i met him he worked for the mafia in the northeast and he was a very dangerous guy and he still is and so what caused him to call me was a conversation we'd had a few months earlier. And he called me and he said, brother, I'm about to die of cancer and I'm about to go settle some scores. And so we had a long conversation about him settling scores and I never knew what he did until he called me up just a few months ago. Actually, I was in Lakeland okay. when he called me up uh, with a wonderful pastor down there. And he called me and he said, I just wanted you to know you make a difference. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, I decided that since God forgave me, I was going to forgive all of them. Wow. Amen. Wow. So a lot of people kept their life because God changed his life. Yeah. And there's one more I want to tell you about. And God is working on this guy so hard and so fast. He's in the second motorcycle club he's ever been in. And he used to be in a 1% motorcycle club in the Northeast. And now he's in a different motorcycle club in Florida. And he began to talk to me about what was going on in his life. 
after his girlfriend got killed in a motorcycle wreck. And God gave me the opportunity to speak into his life. And his life is changed. And he's doing everything he can to be what he described as being a good Christian. What makes that important? Well, not only was he in a 1% motorcycle gang in the Northeast, but he's been indicted for murder 11 times. Wow. How many of you know God can change anybody and everybody if you'll just submit yourself to him? He'll change your life. Amen. God bless you, Pastor. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Now, after service, uh, if you're going to be hanging out in the lobby and any of you guys are motorcycle guys or want to be, you can talk to uh, Fred afterward. Gene, you look like a motorcycle guy. Do you ever have a motorcycle? See, I knew he did. I thought that. But uh, you want to make sure you connect with Fred after service. So thanks for coming and being Amen, here. Amen, Pastor. Thanks for having All me. Right. God bless you. Bless you. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Well, we've got lots of things happening, and it's been a busy weekend, but we have a new worship guide. Trust you got that, and take a look at it. It's got lots of uh, activities and things that are happening. Um, we spent some time this week working on how we're going to reopen things here and move to uh, the next phase for the church, and uh, we're going to have some summer fun things that we brainstormed outside safely and still gather together as a church family. So on uh, Wednesday, the 24th of June, we're going to gather together and uh, have an outdoor church family picnic. And then on Sunday, the 28th, we'll start back with uh, small group ministries and midweek programming and children and nursery as well. And uh, there's guidelines in here and some things that'll tell you about children's ministry. Uh, the kids are going to register in the lobby of the church and come in for worship. And then as we transition from worship to the word, we'll have the children come forward for prayer and then dismiss them with Pastor Elizabeth and our team. And they'll take them on. For nursery, you'll still register in the lobby, but then head over to uh, the children's area and they'll let you in and get you settled with your children in nursery. Uh, in the nursery and children's area, uh, we're going to limit capacity, uh, so we'll have that posted. We hit that capacity. We can't handle any more. Um, we're going to do that and, and just let you know that now. Everything will be deep cleaned. We're going to clean everything after every Sunday. Uh, we're going to get rid of things that would be high risk, plush toys or anything like that as well. Another thing we're going to do is we're going to have uh, Ziploc bags with craft kits for all the individual children. And uh, they'll be theirs, and when they come, they can put their name on it and have it from week to week. But we need your help filling those and bringing them back for the uh, uh, 21st. So this next Sunday and the next Sunday, the 14th and the 21st, bring these back. There's a list here inside the Ziploc bags, and they're in a basket, I think. Elizabeth, or the basket right there, Elizabeth has. She'll be in the lobby afterward and get you those. Take, take one home or more. And in that, this has got the things in it. It's, uh, you've, you've got some crayons and safety scissors, glue sticks, paintbrush, uh, a mechanical pencil, highlighter, and those are things that those kids can use and have and hang on to them. Plus, if you want to help with our children in nursery, uh, we need some more uh, hands and help with that as well. Um, we'll be also doing, just while that reminds me, our workers will have a temperature check when they come in, and then also the children will in the lobby as well to make sure there's no fever or temperature, just to make it a safe place. And then on Wednesday, July 1st, that'll be our first family night. So we've got groups that meet pretty well every day of the week. And uh, so on Monday, Shirley sends intercessory prayer group. Tuesday, WMs. Uh, Wednesday, family night, the first, will all be happening and programs all week long. So that will take place and want to encourage you to be part of that. Um, just going to ask real quickly, I think, Pastor Terry, do we have communion or do we have trays of communion? Um, just want to make sure Stan get it ready. If you did not get, we're going to have communion at the end of the service, but if you did not get communion, just raise your hand. They're coming down the aisles, and it's uh, there's a couple over here. Some folks, everybody over here, there's a couple over here as well need it. And uh, just keep your hand raised till they get to you, and uh, we'll talk about that. But if you can help us with the uh, children's ministry, either volunteering or getting some of those items in the craft kits, uh, Dollar Tree has them all, or go get packs, multi-packs at Walmart or Target and bring those back either next Sunday or the Sunday after that. Well, yesterday was farm share, Catherine. We had farm share, and uh, 
the last hour the team got soaking wet it poured rain and so all of our farm share volunteers are nice and squeaky clean and uh, that was good they all got showers yesterday and uh, but thank you to all the volunteers almost 36,000 pounds of groceries yesterday went out and that was amazing I don't know if we got video or not uh, we do not have video all right but uh, we gave out lots of groceries yesterday and that was amazing and groceries again this uh, Tuesday at 530 for seniors from the church and then Wednesday morning about 8 o'clock 830 uh, will be groceries as well Friday night we were gonna have a worship night and uh, Wednesday afternoon I was talking to Lou Timothy May at Friendship Missionary and he and I were talking about what's going on with the unrest and as you know last Sunday I talked about um, the issue of George Floyd and what happened and the concern that I had with that and and the posts that were coming on Facebook and the protests we're watching on the news now of course we don't condone violence at all however I was very concerned that we need to be prob we need to be solution driven not problem driven and what is the answer for this and so we called a prayer rally for Friday night and we wanted to have prayer together because and i just remember the first billy graham crusade i went to and uh they had the pulpit where he preached from and behind him was a banner and if you look at most pictures there's always a banner above his head christ is the answer and you know that's the answer for what's going on right now but we need to advocate change and i talked to some other pastors to come and I called Isaac Williams at Greater Vine Baptist Church on W Street, or on uh, Pace Boulevard. And uh, he said, well, what do you want to do at this rally? I said, I want to pray. He said, when Martin Luther King was in jail, he had all these pastors saying, I'm praying for you. And they, he responded to them, don't pray for me, do something. And yes, we need to pray, and God is the answer, but we also have to take steps for some action. And so we need to look at how we effectively make a difference. And we need to change some things with law enforcement and legislation. And I talked to Senator Broxton three times this past week, and he's a member of this church, and he's talking about what legislation he needs to propose in the Senate in Tallahassee to bring change. And so we're going to work at that change and making some differences. And uh, Deputy Chief Simmons was here Friday night and talked to him about change in the county law enforcement. And um, Tommy Leiter in the Pensacola Police Department and making change in law enforcement. I said, Lou Timothy, there needs to be something. And he said, you know, you're not like most white pastors. He said, you're opposed, but you don't do anything. You're doing something. And he said, let me show you a video. And so he showed me a video of a couple years ago and it's from his ring security system at his house. And he said, now this is me driving down the street, coming into my home. I pull into my garage, my wife and I. And he said, now see that car parked down the street, watch. And the lights come on the car and the car pulls down and it's a law enforcement vehicle. Stops in front of his driveway. The officer gets out with his flashlight, starts walking around the front of his house looking in the windows, shining his flashlight. Rings the doorbell, steps back into the sidewalk, puts his hand on his revolver, and Blue Timothy goes to the door. And he says, can I help you? He says, do you have ID? He said, can I help you? Do you have ID? He said, what do you want? This is my house. I need you to prove this is your house. He said, this is my house. My kids are in bed. My wife is here. Get off my property. And it, it, you just go, you know what? We need to see some differences happen here. And it's got to be approached differently and we need to start to i mean as a white guy i'd be appalled and object to that well then why don't i be appalled and object to that for my brother who happens to be black we need to do some things we need to make some changes i remember jt at, at united seminary where you were in the doctoral program as the, the director of the program and came just as i was finishing and, and and sam proctor martin luther king's mentor was there and lectured and did some chapels and we came back to our peer group and, and Howard Snyder, the prof for our peer group, he said, uh, well, let's go around the circle and respond to what Sam Proctor said about racism in America. 
And I said, I'm from Toronto. I've got 81 countries in my church, 31 different nationalities and 18 different languages. I got six services in four languages. This is not an issue. He said, oh yes, it is. I said, why is it an issue for me when I'm in a multicultural, multiracial, multilingual church in a very multi-cosmopolitan city? He said, because you're a white man. He said, you have a responsibility. Well, fast forward now, and for the last 14 years, I've been a white pastor in a black community. I have a responsibility, and I've got to do something. So we had a rally Friday, and then Tyler Burns, pastor at New Dimensions, he wanted to have pastors meet with the mayor at Graffiti Bridge yesterday afternoon. And as soon as I heard the news of what was going on at Graffiti Bridge, I said, it's not safe. I, I can't go. Ted Trailer texted me. He said, I'm not able to go either. So we need to start having some solutions and some changes. And we need to start taking some steps. And so I, I want to share a word with you this morning of what's going to help us with this. So last Sunday, we, we talked about um, the need to have spiritual blindness corrected. And, and we've got to remove the, just as Paul on the road to Damascus had the scales removed from his eyes when he encountered the presence of God, we need to have scales removed from our eyes and we need to get some spiritual glasses and see things clearly. In Ephesians, it talks about the eyes of our heart being enlightened. And, and that needs to happen. It says, I pray that the eyes of your heart be enlightened opened up. Let the light shine into our heart and let us see as God wants us to see. Well, I want to give part two to this word as to what we need to do. And the next step is unity. And so when Lou Timothy and I met Wednesday afternoon and talked, well, we talked on the phone Wednesday, we met Thursday. And when we talked on the phone Wednesday and he said, well, what can you do? You need to have a voice. When I talked to Isaac Williams at, at Greater Vine, he said, what are you going to do? And I said, we're going to pray and we're going to call to action. And we want to have a unity prayer rally. And those three words are really critical for what we did Friday night. And, and there's an article in the news journal and there's a, a video clip on Channel 3 and, of what happened and what took place and lots of pictures and things that happened. And I really believe it was a, a, a driving a stake, a memorial of saying things are going to need to change and we need to start walking them out. And it's important for us to do that. And so it, it's going to happen through prayer. It's going to happen through unity, and it's going to happen by rallying around a specific cause. And, and, you know, we can just pray God bless us, but no, what are we specifically asking God to do? And that's to divinely intervene. And so unity is important. And, and, and when we talk about this, it's when we come together and have one purpose, one church, one vision, one heart, one spirit, things change. When we can unify ourselves, whereas that doesn't usually happen in churches. I, I love the story of the man that was shipwrecked on a deserted island and finally was rescued several years later. And as they're picking him up, they look up on the hill above the beach and there's three buildings. And the people rescuing him said, what's that first building? Oh, that's where I, the hut I built where I live. What's the second one? Oh, that's the church I go to. What's the third one? That's the church I used to go to. You live alone and yet we still can't get along. We need to bring unity in the church so we can have one voice and make a stand and say, you know what, it's time to make a difference. And it happens when we're unified because too often in churches it's double-minded, double-standard, double-sided and bringing about double trouble. We need to be careful about this. I'm not, now, get me, understand me on this. It's not uniformity. It's not everybody's the same. You can have unity with diversity. You can have diversity, and that diversity is what makes us unique. And so I believe this is so true. Unity without uniformity, but recognizing uniqueness. And, and I talk about this in marriage conferences all the time, of a husband and wife together, that it truly is opposites attract, and Deborah's about as different from me as night and day. Next week, Ed, my wife and I are celebrating our 43rd wedding anniversary. How's that? So we're getting close. We're going to catch up to you. But uh, 43 years, and, and, and we're about as different as night and day. The things that I love about Deborah are the things that absolutely frustrate and make me mad. And the things that Deborah loves about me is absolutely what frustrates and makes her mad. We are opposite, but she makes me better because she's so different than me. She sees things that I don't see. I remember we first started ministering and she said, you need to call this person. I go, why? 
Just call him. I said, but I got to know why. No, you don't. Just call him. I don't want to call him unless I know why. Just call him. Do what I, I and I'm a guy. I'm not just going to do what you tell me to do. Will you please, finally I realized I'm not going to get peace unless I call. So I call, and you know what the person on the other end of the phone says? I knew you were going to call me. I needed to talk to you. I hang up the phone. I go, how'd you do that? I still don't understand how she does it, but I've learned after 43 years of marriage. <laughs> she says, can you just reach out and talk to so-and-so? Yep, sure will. Because she's got this antenna that, that's tuned in to the voice of God that I don't get. I prayed for it, but I don't have it. She does. The phrase we use all the time in ministry at the altar is, I go wide because I want everybody to get prayed for. She goes deep and zeroes in on one. Gene, you've seen it. I mean, she just zeroes in and zones out. I mean, when she's in the spirit, don't even talk to her. She's just gone. Totally different. I'm making sure everybody gets prayer. I'm the pastor. That's what I got. It's the differences. And that diversity is what makes us as a church unique. This church is about as unique as they come. We, we've got some guests here from out of state, and I told them both, I said, we're just crazy. Because we got all kinds of stuff going on, and it's, it's great. Now, we've calmed it down a little bit because of all the things going on, but there's creativity, there's differences. And, and one of the things I've learned is we worship and express ourselves in different ways. Heather through worship dance and Hope Moore and Ellen through painting and other people do it in different ways. Wayne Benson is a mentor of mine. He's about 10, 15 years older than me and pastored a large church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Deborah's folks had retired in Big Rapids and we would go see them and visit it after Christmas and usually 4th of July when the kids would get out of school and we would go to First Assembly in Grand Rapids and go to church and Wayne was the pastor and when I'd have a problem or something was going on, I'd call Wayne and ask for advice. They were running three services and about 5,000 people in those three services. And, and the church I was in Toronto was running about two and a half, three thousand. 3,000. And so he would help me with that. And I remember when we were changing worship pastors and our worship pastor was, was moving on and, and, and going to another place and I was hiring another new youth new worship pastor and was asking, well, let me give you my philosophy of worship. And it helped me understand what wor worship is personal. Worship is private. Worship is, has to touch your heart. And, and just as people like different styles of music, when I watched Ravi Zacharias' funeral, who would have known Lecrae, the rapper, was one of Ravi Zacharias' best friends? And he closed the memorial service with a rap. When he first got up, he said, he would, Ravi was helping me with my uh, theology, and I was helping him with his rap. <laughs> I can't imagine an East Indian rapping and who's an apologist and theologian rapping, but he said he did actually try it a couple times. Probably didn't do well, but that's Ravi. And so understanding that diversity together, and when it comes to music and worship, we're all different. Some like country, some like Gaither, some like hip hop, some like gospel. It all depends on who you are and what touches your life. And, and what's interesting is, and we talked about this before, that everybody has a song. Everybody has a song that ministers to you and it touches your heart. And Wayne Benson said, you know, as a pastor, you've got to make sure that it's not just one flavor. You've got to have songs that reach people in different places. It's good to sing some of the old songs. It's good to sing a new song. Everybody needs a different sound, and every generation has a sound. Well, that's our diversity, but we still can be in unity. And there is power in unity, and so let's talk about that just for a minute before we go to communion. There's a word in the New Testament, a Greek word, that's very significant. And, and it's a word that's translated in English as one accord. And, and the word is... Homothumadon. That's how you sound it out phonetically. Homothumadon. And there are these different references in the book of Acts that use that Greek word, which is translated in the King James as one accord. You can also substitute unity. Having that unity brings about power. Acts 1.14. They all continued with one accord in prayer. And we know what happens in Acts 2, Pentecost, and the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, 46, 
talks about our purposes and it says they continue daily with one accord in the temple breaking bread from house to house with gladness and singleness of heart they had purpose they were in unity they were in one accord Acts 4.24 is when praise happens in unity, what takes place? It says they lifted up their voice in verse 24 to God with one accord. And then a couple verses later in verse 26, it says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. When you're in one accord, it releases the power of God. When we're in unity, things happen. So here's what happens. We see a murder of a man through law enforcement, George Floyd. We see protests coming and condemning the act. And then I'm saying, all right, where's the solution? How are we going to bring change? What takes place? And I'm looking for that change. And God says, get rid of your spiritual blindness and put on spiritual glasses. God says this week, get unified, because when you're unified, that releases the power of God. And the power of God in one accord is stronger than the power of God for just one of us. Two or three of you gather in my name, it shall be done. Does that mean it's not going to be done if you pray by yourself? No, but it is escalated and it's magnified and multiplied when you come together in unity. If two or three of you Gather in my name, I'm there. Does that mean he's not with you when you're by yourself? No, he is, but his presence is magnified. When you, I can worship in my car and the presence of God fills my car. But there's nothing better than being in the house of God together with you. It brings that presence. Fourthly, Acts 5, 12, it says, The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people, and they were all with one accord. When you are in one accord, it releases the power of God. Acts 8, 6, And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spoke. And talking about the speaking of the word, the word becomes powerful when we're in one accord. Now, I believe this, that when we gather here on Sunday and I begin to preach, you're praying for what God can do. And quite often we'll have a move of God and God will come to this altar and move and I'll say, saints, be praying right now for what God's doing here. You ever notice it? How, how, many, how many have been here? We've had a prayer tunnel here at the front. You've been here at the prayer tunnel. And we're, doing the, we're having a prayer tunnel and people are going through and people are praying for people. And about halfway through quite often, I don't know what you sense, but I'm up here on the platform praying for those that are praying for people going through the prayer tunnel. I'll sense it's starting to wane a bit and I'll call the church to pray. I said, all right, folks, come on, let's escalate prayer. Let's intercede. Let's storm the gates of heaven. Let's, let's step it up a bit. And all of a sudden, the power of God starts coming stronger again. How does that work? I don't understand it all. All I know is, is when we unify together, it intensifies the power and presence of God. Acts 8, 6, when they began to preach the word, they were in one accord. Lastly, Acts 15, 25, it says, It seemed good to us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men. When you gather in one accord, you see anointings released. I love that Sunday, Catherine, when Deborah came to you and said, You're called to ministry. You're going to be in ministry. You have a call of God on your life. Deborah didn't know that she was being approved by CGIA to be ordained here the next Sunday. Talk about confirmation. When you gather in one accord, call and purpose to God's call and purpose in your life becomes evident. It's amazing how that works. It's amazing how we're able to move forward with the presence of God when we're in unity. So here's my conclusion, is when we wanna see God move in this house, we wanna see God move in this community, we wanna see God change things in our state, you know what, we need to get unified. You see, the protesters don't have it all wrong. They realize that there is strength in numbers. They realize they're going to be heard when they gather together. You see, godly principles work whether you believe in God or not. Because they're principles here on earth. I just want to tell you, they come faster, better, and stronger, and more godly when you do it under the umbrella of God's hand and God's power. It's the same principle of giving and finances that 
business owners know that if they don't give to good causes a portion of their profits, their business just doesn't do as well. So they give and they may be the most pagan CEO around, but they know that something happens to their bottom line when they're benevolent. So God's principle of unity works. In Ephesians 4, verse 3 to 6, listen to this. It says this, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. And then verse 4, there is one body, one Spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. That's our God. That's our faith. That's our unity together. God himself declared that not only unity is possible, but unity is powerful. We want to see change happen. It's going to happen by unifying together as a church in believing God. So if you rewind a little bit back to, I think, is Judy Schultz here? Yeah, she's right over here. And... Uh, Judy and I talked, I had her share, and we talked about the spiritual gates and the spiritual strongholds in Pensacola. And we were gearing up for prayer movement and praying at the gates and praying at the, the strongholds and so on for our city. And then COVID-19 happens. And you know what? It, JT, it dawned on me this week. God said, you know what? You were on the right track of praying down strongholds in this city. But it wasn't just going to be a spiritual movement. It was going to be a bigger movement than that. And it's almost like he put a pause on all of that and said, let me show you the real picture of what you're going to deal with. And some of the things that are being exposed right now and we need to deal with as a church, as a community, and as a city and a state and a nation, it's going to reflect and have an impact on where we're headed as a nation for the next 10, 20, 30 years. There's never been a more critical moment for this nation that I've ever seen than right now. We are divided as divided as it was in the 60s, as it was in 1860, as it was in 1760. It's time for us to do something. It's time for us to start moving forward. And my prayer and my belief, let me rewind it now all the way back. My prayer is not just protest. My prayer is not just law enforcement legislation. My prayer is not just law enforcement education. My prayer is a third great awakening. I want to see more, more. It's time. And I've said it again and again and again, and you've all heard it. First great awakening, pre-declaration of independence, revolutionary war. And I believe out of the first great awakening, this nation was birthed. Second Great Awakening, pre-Civil War. I believe the Second Great Awakening brought about the Emancipation Proclamation and the defeat of slavery as a law in the land. And when I look at what's happening right now in the division in this country, it's the same division that occurred in the 1700s and the 1800s, and we're there now. And unless we have a Third Great Awakening, I don't want to go there. Because if we don't, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to take place. I don't think it's coincidental that this is an election year for the President of the United States. And this is critical. It's crucial. And we need to start praying now. We need to start taking action now. But it's only going to be effective if we unify. Get rid of the spiritual blinders. Let God help us see what we need to see clearly. We need to have honest dialogues about what issues are, but move forward together in spiritual unity. Does that make sense? You hear where I'm going? I mean, I'm concerned about this, and it's not, I'm not just preaching willy-nilly out of the Bible. I'm saying this is critical for us. And what happened Friday night was critical for us. What's been happening in the last 14 years. So... In the same way, and here's the picture God gave me yesterday morning, Catherine, with Farm Share. And Brenda Lee, I think you're here as well. Here's the same way, here's what I saw yesterday with Farm Share. And I've used this verse for what we do at Farm Share. Jesus said, 
When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink and so on, right? And then he said, you fed me, you did this. And then the disciples said, well, when did we see you? He said, when you've done this to the least of them, you've done it unto me. So I said, we've been doing that. We've been giving a cup of cold water in the name of Jesus. So we see brothers and sisters, African-American, being mistreated, dealt improperly, unjustly. I don't care what George Floyd record was. Nobody deserves someone's knee on their neck for eight minutes. That's just not, not acceptable. So when we do something for the least, and here's what Jesus, here's what God told me yesterday. He said, when we reach down to deal with something of an injustice such as that, what happens is we're doing it to him. It's as if an officer had the knee on Christ's neck. We would do something. When you do it for the least, you've done it to him. Now, when we put it in that perspective, I get convicted. Someone says, don't compare George Floyd to Jesus. I'm not. But he's a soul that Jesus died for. He's a soul. There was a pastor who stumbled morally, and I reached out to him. We met, and I helped him and walked into his life and helped him. The district superintendent called me and said, what are you doing? I heard you're meeting with so-and-so. I said, yes, I am. He said, well, you know, this is what happened. This is what's going on. I said, yeah. He said, then why would you do that? I said, because even a man on death row deserves a pastor. It's time to take a stand and make a difference. And I'm praying none of you are going, I can't believe a pastor's saying I, I am. I am. Because we've got to reach out. We've got to make a difference. Joan, I applaud you for your stand, you and Robert, in adopting three kids that were homeless. And you took them in. And you got three great kids. They're amazing. But you know, you reached out and you did something different. Yeah, he did it through you. But you see, God wants to do something now by us, reaching out and doing something. So I want us to close with communion. And JT, I'm wondering, would you help me with communion? Would you help me with communion here? Come up and join me if you would. I can't think of a better way to close this service in unity in unity then through communion together. So I'm still getting used to the K-cup communion. So this isn't for coffee, this is for communion. Peel back the top carefully. I've done the juice at the same time and gotten it all over me, so be careful. I know, I gotta be careful with that. I'm gonna grab a microphone over here. JT, you have anything to add to what I said this morning? <laughs> yeah, JT's preaching next Sunday, by the way. So it's going to be good. You're going to save your ammo for then. All right, all right. Lead us in prayer for communion. We'll take the bread and juice together. First, let's look to God. On the night that he was betrayed, he, they supped. And he did something strange. He got down in front of them and he took his garments and he washed their feet. Mm -hmm. They didn't understand what was happening, but he said, I'm doing this so you can learn to be servants. I'll wash your feet, you wash someone else's feet. Then he took bread and wine and he blessed it. Let us bless the bread. God, we praise you for this bread, which was representative of your body, broken for us on Calvary's cross. You said we are to eat this bread in remembrance of you. And as we take this bread into our body, we become a part of you. And you live through us. So let us commune with the bread. Amen. And in like manner, he took the cup and he blessed it. God blessed this cup that it become symbolic of 
your blood which was shed on Calvary's cross. And you know when he shed it, that blood, he shed it blood for everyone born. Black, white, red, green, yellow, blue, God shed his blood. His blood is red, <laughs> praise God. Yeah. Red blood flows in all of us. That's right. This blood was shed for you for the remission of sins, the remission of systemic racism, the remission of all things that hold other people down. We drink this in the name of Jesus. Let us commune. Amen. Oh, the blood of Jesus, yes, oh, the blood of Jesus, yes, oh, the blood of Jesus, it washes white as snow. Let's all stand and sing it one more time. towards heaven right now. Father, we reach to you because we're not going to see change unless you engage in this world. So we reach to heaven to bring your power down, to see your power released through unity together. You take your hand and put it on your heart. And we pray, Lord, that that power would change us, that this transformation would begin with us, that you would evaluate our heart. You would review our heart. And if there be anything in us that's not of you, let it be convicted. Let us repent and ask for forgiveness through the blood of Jesus. Now just reach your hand out as you're looking to someone else beside you, not touching them, but just saying, this is my brother, this is my sister. That we are in unity together. It cannot happen without being unified as the body of Christ, making a difference together. And I thank you, O oh God, for the unity of the Spirit, unity in the church, and the unity that's going to bring change. We ask you to be with us as we leave this place and let our lives make a difference. In Jesus' name we pray. If you agree, can you say amen? Amen. God bless you as you go. We'll see you next Sunday. And again, the offering is there at the exit as you leave this place. God bless you. Your blood is